morning, Missio. This is your call to worship. In this moment, gracious God, you have called us away from the world to an intimate place in time where we can commune with you. Hallow this communion, we pray. Calm our anxious spirits that we may be set apart to hear your word of truth through which we receive grace to bring about the obedience of faith. Open us to the reality of your all-embracing love, both in this place and in the wider world. May we, by our words and actions, be bearers of your kingdom. In the name and spirit of Christ, amen. Hey, Missio. Randall here. Hope you guys are hanging in there. I uh, miss seeing your faces on Sundays, but I'm still grateful we get to connect and support each other in different ways. Um, today for Missio Voice, I wanted to give you guys a financial update. Um, we approved a 2020 budget in uh, January 29th, and I think there will be a provided chart, but that kind of uh, uh, lays out all of our uh, monthly expenses so you can see the the whole year. 
um, and then you'll also see our income from January and February. So in January we had a nice little surprise um, uh, being about $10,000 above our expenses uh, which allowed us to add to our uh, $80,000 reserve goal. Uh, we were able to put in around $3,400, $3,500 into the reserve account and the, the rest in our um, operating account. Um, so in February our um, income was pretty close to actually to what we projected which was about $3,000 under our uh, expense line. Um, our, our budget this year is expected to be cash positive, but um, just based on how uh, giving ebbs and flows, there's a few months where you know we have higher expenses than what we bring in, and then there's some other months that make up for it that have um, more income than uh, our expense line. So. Anyways, that's not surprising, and still, like I said, we were able to, we're about 14% on our reserves goal. Um, so far in March, um, we're pretty close to what we were expecting, um, with a bit of a drop-off uh, at the end of the month, probably due to, you know, this COVID-19 um, stuff that's going on. It's just a different environment, not being able to meet, and um, is pretty unknown. I think for all of us, so I'm sure you're feeling that as well. Um, just one thing from a budget management perspective um, that's helpful, and it may be helpful to you too, that while you're settling into your new rhythms, if you guys set up reoccurring giving, maybe it's just for uh, the, a brief time or however long it takes to kind of settle in, um, that's helpful for us just to kind of look forward and and see what we can uh, somewhat expect and and then also uh, just kind of keeps giving a little more consistent. Um, but I don't say that from like a place of anxiety. Uh, I, I know that um, it is kind of an anxious time but I'd encourage you also um, just to be sensitive to the needs around you. I think this is an opportunity to experience uh, the gift of generosity to grow in our trust of God um, and that also may be a, a time where you need pr provision and uh, I would just ask that you please be brave speak your needs maybe to us or um, to someone in your house church or really uh, anybody that attends this community that we could be the church and support not only each other but the the needs in our communities it might be an opportunity to um, meet your neighbors and, and know how they're doing and, and uh, well, I guess stay six feet away, but um, definitely get to know them, um, be sensitive to the needs around you. Uh, this allows us to know the person of God, to know his heart and, and how he cares for us, um, and, and that based on our worth and the value that he shows us and the love he shows us that we can extend that to to others so i just want to leave you with this it's actually a verse that my wife has a tattoo of i'm pretty fond of uh, says it's luke 12 verse 6 are not five sparrows sold for two pennies yet not one of them is forgotten by god indeed the very hairs of your head are numbered don't be afraid you are worth more than many sparrows. Love you guys. Hope you're doing good. Good morning, Missy O'Day. We got some reading to do today. We're going to be in Luke 22, verses 7 through 13 this morning. Let's get into it. Then came the day of unleavened bread, of which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. 
So we actually have a bonus, another section we're going to today. We're going to Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. So let's flip along on this book-based journey, and let's read some Exodus 3, verses 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people of Israel, or the people, the Israelites, out of Egypt.
Hey, Missio, Johnny, Heather here, uh, doing another worship video, um, sermon video for community worship this week. Um, we're sad not to be able to gather with you to actually be around the table, present physically with one another, but thankful for technology like this and Zoom in a way that we can still connect, still study the story of Jesus, still be reminded that our God transcends physicality. And even through things like Zoom, it's actually present to us as we gather together. So we believe that and we're thankful for that. And yeah, here we are. Uh, we are, if you've kind of been following along with us throughout the season of Lent or even kind of last week as we started doing this kind of video, we've been in the book of Luke. And as we come to the end of Luke, you have these two meals that take place. And both are really substantive and beautiful moments. And one is before the crucifixion of Jesus, and one follows the resurrection of Jesus. And these two meals, one that happens before, which happens on Passover, which is this like historic moment, and then the other one that comes following the resurrection, they are symbolic of practices that become the lifeblood of the early church, and then all the way throughout history to this very moment, still the lifeblood of the community. And so as we kind of focus in on this last bit of Luke, we wanted to focus in on those two meals because we believe that those two meals, not only do they tell the story of the gospel, not only do they invite us into something deep and wide and beautiful, but they also are exactly what we need in this moment of being in the wilderness. These two meals that God gives to his people before they enter into the wilderness. So we're going to look at those two meals, but to understand them at all, we actually have to go back before the Gospel of Luke, all the way to the story of the Exodus, to the first meal that God gives his people, the Passover meal. And as you just heard Jonathan do the readings um, from chapter Luke chapter 22, but then also Exodus, you recognize in there that Jesus sends his disciples out to prepare the Passover meal. And the Passover was this Jewish celebration that culminated kind of at the high holiday of their year, similar to what as the Christian tradition, like our high holidays that we would celebrate Easter. They celebrate Passover. And so Jesus in Luke chapter 22 sends his disciples to go and prepare this meal. Um, and this is a meal that they would have been very familiar with. The components and symbols within the meal would have had a lot of familiarity to them. And the meal was there to tell a story. It was a way that they worshipped God and traditionally retelling the story of the Exodus, their rescue out of slavery from Egypt. And God saved them. And it's easy in particular kinds of moments to wonder if God really cares and to ask the question if God sees. And in Exodus chapter 3, um, where Jonathan just read, it says here that God says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people. I have seen their suffering and I have come down to deliver them. And so this story or this meal that they share that tells the story held a lesson within it. It wasn't like these ideas that they had to keep a hold of, but instead it was this tangible tactile thing that they did to call them back to who they were and who God was. And there were some really specific um, symbols that the meal um, pointed to. And so that's why the disciples had to go ahead and prepare because there were very specific things that were laid out on the table during Passover. And um, some of you may be familiar with that and others not. One of the components of the meal was the unleavened bread because they were in a hurry. They didn't know that this, what this situation ahead of them was going to be and they had to prepare quickly and so they had this unleavened bread they also had these bitter herbs on the table and in exodus chapter one it talked about the experience that they had in the midst of the egyptians was that it was bitter and actually subsequently from that they went on and treated the people around them in a way that was bitter and so the reason that these bitter herbs were on the table was so that um, they could remember the human condition that there are things that happen to us and things that we do to others that um, create grief and sadness. And that we need to remember those and that we grieve and cry and in the midst of that we hope for God's redemptive presence um, to shape 
and to come into those places. So the bitter herbs are sitting on the table. And then along with the bitter herbs is the lamb. And the lamb was this kind of picture of the way out. And every time they remembered that they had a way out as they were eating this lamb. And then another symbol that feels important to remember is this cup of wine. They drank a lot of wine during the celebration. Um, but one of the, the cups of wine was at the end and they left the cup there as this picture of a symbol of hope that Messiah would come. That there would be um, the presence of God would come to them very specifically. And that's what this passage in Exodus says too. It's that I have come down, meaning that God is in, coming towards us to be with us in these places of unsettledness. And so all of this symbolism pointed the people back to who they were and the hope that they could place in God. And they did it over and over and over again, year after year after year, so that they could be called back into their heritage, back into their rootedness and groundedness. Because they always stepped into new circumstances and new uncertainties. And with that came this temptation um, to believe other kinds of things. To believe that does God really care? That do we matter? Are we seen in this moment? Um, that the anxiety and the fear would kind of take hold or the need to distract away out of these circumstances. Or maybe even false senses of pride in people that believed that there could be a control or a certainty that they could somehow get. And I think if we're honest with ourselves in our, in our own moment of uncertainty, it's easy for us to get called out of our own story and the story of Jesus and to live into the anxieties and the fear or the distraction or the pride that we could somehow control something. And so the meal, this tangible meal, kind of brought them back um, to what was true and good and whole in this moment of fractured and uncertainty. And the meal held a message. And that message was that God hears and cares for his people. God heard and cared for his people in Egypt. And as they went out into the into the wilderness, the meal held that message that God hears and cares for his people. And then that's the same message that we can hear as we look at these words in Luke. As they went to prepare the Passover, we can hear that same message that God in this meal or in this picture of this meal that is presented to us in Luke, it's a reminder for us to know that God hears and cares for his people. That means that he hears he is and cares for us too. So God gives this meal, this Passover meal to the people of Israel as a remembrance that God hears, that he's with, that he rescues the people from Egypt. And he institutes the meal as a practice that the people of God are supposed to do in repetition, hold on to as they enter into the wilderness, unknowing of what comes next or what's going to happen or how their life is going to be organized. And there's a reason for that. There's actually multiple reasons that God would give them this meal as they enter into an unknown space. And as Heather already mentioned, the meal is in one part how they remember this story. It's how they remember who God is, that he rescued them, that he delivered them from Egypt, that he heard them and came to them. And what's, what's fascinating, actually, is that God doesn't give the people of Israel a text at that moment. Um, he doesn't give them a letter. He doesn't give them a scroll. This is not the moment of the Ten Commandments. There's nothing written. Instead, there's a meal, mm. a practice of gathering together, of doing these elements, of administering these different features in order to rehearse and participate in the story, to remember who God is and who they are in light of who God is. So they're given the meal to remember the story. And as they remember the story, then they're also being shaped into a kind of people, a people of that story, a people of dependence and rescue in the new world of the wild. It is so important for Israel that as they have been pulled out of Egypt and they're entering into Canaan, that they don't look like either Egypt or Canaan. And this meal is actually intended to shape their imagination, to shape them as a people, to form them so that they are different than those people. Like they don't have a pledge of allegiance. They don't have uh, like a battle hymn of the Republic or a national anthem. Instead, their political practice is a meal. That's what shapes them, informs them. And at the heart of that meal is the story that Heather said, that God rescued them, that they are dependent upon God, that God hears them, that he joins them, that he sees them. Mm -hmm. That's the practice that forms the people, a meal, not, a, not an anthem, not a pledge, 
but a meal that declares the goodness of God. And so the meal shapes them as a people. And as it's shaping them, the meal also helps witness to who God is in the midst of them. When God leads the people of Israel into the wilderness, there's this moment, he's already given them the Passover meal, and there's this moment in Exodus 19 where God is kind of explaining to the people why he's done all of this. Like he's, I mean, he's already said it multiple times, but he gets them together right around Mount Sinai, and he tells them this in Exodus 19, verse 5 through 6. He says, Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. All the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Israel is called out of Egypt into a special relationship with the creator of the universe, not just for themselves, but so that they might extend the beauty and the goodness of their relationship with the creator to the nations around them. And just as they were invited in through a meal, they hold a meal, a symbol of a table where they're supposed to be inviting the rest of the nations to participate in the goodness of God. So the table forms them, it tells them a story, and it's how they extend this story to the world around them, how they are a blessing to the world, how they are a nation of priests who mediate or extend God's presence. And finally, as it's doing all this, as it's shaping us and forming us and telling the story and witnessing to something else, the meal points us towards the ultimate hope. Just as it reminded Israel of the rescue that had come, it points them towards their need and hope in ultimate rescue. As they ate and drank, they could say, like, this is our story. God is our rescuer. We are his people. We have been called out of a way of life for the sake of others, and now we have a hope that there is an ultimate rescue to come. That history has movement, that present has purpose, and that future has hope. That's what they did when they participated in this meal. Told a story and hoped in a story to come. And so then as we kind of practice this and hear this story, there's a really logical question, which is, what do we do with it? And every week when we gather together at Missio, we go around our own table And it's the table that Jesus will then talk about and we'll talk about more next week. It's the table that he sets that we now call Eucharist in communion. And it came out of this moment of Passover. He established that. But there are these things that we do now that allow us to rehearse this story that doesn't just start with us, but started Mm -hmm. with this long history of God being present. And so there are ways that we continue to do that. We do that by taking communion together, Mm -hmm. um, by remembering that we have a God who is present to us in Christ by his spirit, that he wants to rescue us out of anxiety and fear and wants to remind us of our dependence upon him. And that is so loudly real right now Mm -hmm. that we have a need as humans and that we are dependent on a God who says he is present to us through his spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that we then get to extend to others um, in this moment. Mm-hmm. So one way, as Heather mentioned, is we're going to do that together at Easter. But Easter does not have to be the only moment that we practice having a meal focused on the story of God in our homes. I think we're invited every time we sit down at our table mm-hmm. to practice this story. Mm-hmm. And there's actually lots of easy kind of practical ways that we can make the table in our home a table of presence and a table of this story. As you gather around your table just this week, you could rehearse the Exodus story, read the text from Exodus 3 on or the Passover moment specifically and remember God's rescue of the people. Or maybe you could jump forward to Luke and you could read the moment of Jesus instituting communion, the Last Supper, with his disciples and tell that story as you gather. Or maybe as you gather to have a meal, you could institute a moment where you're practicing gratitude, where you're listening and being thankful for all that God has done and how he's delivered us and how he's rescued us. Maybe there's a way, as Heather mentioned, the bitter herbs, that as we gather around the table, there's a space for us to lament 
for us to name our disappointments and the ways that we're tired and the ways that we're hurt in light of COVID-19 or life generally. And we can do that at this table because it's safe to do that in the presence of God. Mm-hmm. And maybe most importantly, we can find ways as we gather on a Tuesday or a Wednesday to rehearse the story of hope, to know that God has rescued us, that he's invited us into something presently, and that there's an ongoing movement, a culmination of hope that we look towards as we break bread and take the cup, even in our meals, a simple as on a Tuesday. And that's what's so great about God instituting these meals is that these are things that we do every day. And we have these tangible physical symbols and anyone at any age can enter in and participate in this. Um, And so it's a gift. These meals are a gift to us in rehearsing and remembering and grounding ourselves in the story and the presence of God with us. Now, one question that we have to ask and wrestle with as a community in light of this moment that we're in, in light of COVID-19 and social distancing and some places quarantining, is how do we, as the people of God, who, like Israel before us, are invited to be priests and mediators of God's presence, a holy people, how do we extend the goodness and the reality and the presence of the table, the meal that we're invited to, when we can't as easily invite people over to our home or go into other people's homes? How do we uh, envision and imagine and hold on to the substance of the table without all the particulars of the table? When we can't administer the bread, how do we extend what is at the heart of it and what is the hope of the table to those around us? And so, Missy, as you work through this worship guide, as you watch this video, as you pray with your family, as you gather at the table and rehearse and practice a story of hope, would you begin to wrestle this week with what does it mean for us to be the people of God who extend the substance, the hope, the good news of God's table in a moment where it is not easy to extend and administer the particulars of that table? That's our invitation and work as the people of God in the wilderness today. So would you pray for us? Let's pray. Jesus, thanks for um, the meals that you set for us, the meals that have these symbols that call us into being reminded of who you are, your goodness, and what it means to be your people, both of the, as those who know that you hear us and that you respond to us, and that you invite us then to hear and respond to others. Lord, thank you for your generosity and your grace to us. Pray that as we sit around our tables this week, that we would extend that to each other, that we'd hear from each other when we feel sad or when there's things to be lamenting, that that from children to others, that there would be moments where we allow a meal to call us into this kind of intentionality. Lord, help us to um, speak of the hopes that we have, of who you are, the hopes of what it means to be with you and to be known by you. And then as we ask this question of ourselves, how do we allow what we know to be true to extend itself into our city here in Salt Lake? Spirit, would you give us a creative imagination to know how to step towards others and to risk um, to be faithful to the calling that you've given us. So we just entrust ourselves to you and ask that you would remind us of your presentness and move us out of our trust in you this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Missio. If you are able, please rise for your benediction. A benediction is a blessing. And this comes from John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Missio, we have received the peace of Christ. Go, therefore, a people of peace in the presence of our God and be the church this week.